marvelous watercolors by Dranet Trelaw in this exhibition continue a fertile tradition of artistic work inspired by the celebrated meetings between Anna Akhmatova and Isaiah Berlin in Leningrad in 1945. Anna Akhmatova was one of the greatest Russian poets, some would say the greatest Russian poet of the 20th century, known not only for her poetry, but for her stoicism in the face of persecution by Stalin. Her image is famous from the drawings made of her by her then lover, Amadeo Modigliani, in Paris in 1911, but not seen widely until 1993. <coughs> this one hung in her apartment. No doubt these images have played their part in giving Modigliani <laughs> <laughs> his place in popular culture today. <laughs> I assume that Isaiah Berlin is known to all those present, if only as the first president of this college. A Russian Jew by birth and a British citizen by adoption, he was a thinker, essayist, and public intellectual whose living presence and writings have been an inspiration to many. He was born a Russian citizen in the Baltic seaport of Riga in 1909, and lived in Petrograd, as St. Petersburg was then called, between the ages of six and eleven, witnessing both Russian revolutions in 1917. In 1921, he emigrated to England, returning to Russia for the first time in September 1945 as an employee of the British government. And in November of that year, revisiting the city, which had by then been renamed Leningrad. There, he had an all-night meeting with Akhmatova that has become famous, both in the English-speaking world and in Russia. It is hard to think of any other personal encounter between civilians which has had a wider resonance. In 1989, Berlin gave Russian television a long interview in which he mentions that he is the person Akhmatova called the guest from the future in her poem without a hero. Она понимает, она назвала меня гостем из будущего в поэме без героя. A 2011 Latvian film entitled Escaping Riga recreates the first meeting, starting with Berlin's visit to the writer's bookshop in the Nevsky Prospect. He had invented an innocent story about a visit to Leningrad. Supposedly, he had gone there to comb through the antiquarian bookshops. For during the blockade, the residents had taken rare and vulnerable books in exchange for bread. It was at a bookshop where, according to legend, some literary critic offered to take him to meet Anna Akhmatova. The night he spent with Akhmatova, who, as he put it, was irresistible in a womanly wonderfulness, was an unforgettable experience for Berlin. They both sat across the room from each other, discussing mutual acquaintances 
Akhmatova reading her poetry, including the unpublished poem Requiem, and talking about her childhood by the Black Sea, while Berlin talked about his in Riga. Akhmatova talked about her former husbands and lovers and her loneliness, Berlin about Patricia Douglas. Several hours later, Berlin had the need to pee, but he felt uncomfortable interrupting the majestic poet and was afraid that he might not find the toilet in the dark corridors of the communal apartment. This is one of the most legendary romantic episodes in the history of the 20th century. And naturally, much has been said about it, including the inexplicable appearance of Winston Churchill's son, because he suddenly needed an interpreter to arrange for the storage of caviar in the refrigerator. Whatever really happened, according to Berlin's biography, he never had any doubts that meeting Akhmatova was the most important event in his life. Я только могу сказать, что самый, про это было самое замечательное в моей жизни, моя встреча с ней. Более замечательного в моей жизни никогда не было. То, что только которое осталось у меня навсегда. Я был счастлив, я был горд, я был очень глубоко и на всю жизнь тронут. Что же еще я могу вам сказать? И о ней даю, думаю постоянно. They met again in January 1946, when she gave him two photographs. The first oh, photograph she gave him was one taken in September 1945 by Ida Nappelbaum, which she had signed and dated on the back. The A with a slash through it is her, is her monogram, which she used for all her signatures, and the date says 2nd of January 1946. And one taken in 1916, <laughs> at her home in Sarskoye Sierdo. <laughs> she was very famous and flexible, as you can see. <laughs> she also gave him some books of her poems, in one of which she wrote a poem about their night of conversation. Here she is reading this in Oxford in 1965. <laughs> Навсегда не мершим мире два лишь голоса твой и мой, и под ветер с незримых ладок, хоть почти колокольный звон, в легкий блеск перекрестных радуг разговор ночной превращен. After their January meeting, microphones were installed in her ceiling, and later that year, she was denounced by Stalin's cultural inquisitor, Andrei Zhdanov, who called her half-nun, half-harlot, and had her expelled from the Union of Soviet Writers. Akhmatova believed that her encounters with Berlin had led Stalin to launch the Cold War. Berlin did not share her view. <laughs> He wrote in 1979, I expect that my visit, the first by any foreigner since 1917, did complicate her position somewhat. And although I am assured by various Soviet scholars that Zhdanov would have condemned her in any case, she herself was convinced that Stalin himself was personally furious about the fact that she allowed me to call on her. I was an official of the British Embassy and therefore necessarily a spy. She confirmed this to me when she received her honorary degree in Oxford. She solemnly and repeatedly told me that she and I began the Cold War and wrought fateful changes in the fate of the world. I think she really believed this in some sense. Berlin visited the Soviet Union again in 1956 with his new wife, Aline. 
Akhmatova was unwilling to risk seeing him in person again for fear of the repercussions for herself and especially for her son, Lev Dumilyov, who had only recently been released from a prison camp. But they spoke on the telephone, and Akhmatova congratulated him on his marriage, which cost her a great effort. It was inconsistent with her somewhat mystical, world historical view of her relationship with Berlin, that he should have married. <laughs> In 2009, a Russian TV program entitled Akhmatova Against Stalin included a reconstruction that highlights the Randolph Churchill episode. <laughs> Владимир Орлов сопровождает Берлина в фонтанный дом. По сравнению с благополучными московскими писательскими домами, квартира Ахматовой поражает послевоенной нищетой. Буквально через несколько минут после начала беседы со двора послышались пьяные вопли. «Айзайя! Айзайя!» Оказалось, что это кричит приятель Берлина, корреспондент агентства «Рейтер» Рандольф Черчилль, сын британского премьер-министра. Как выяснилось, ему надо было всего лишь пристроить черную икру в холодильник. Решив проблему приятеля, к 9 часам вечера Берлин возвращается к Ахматовой в фонтанный дом. Англичанин рассказывает о жизни ее старых друзей в эмиграции. Ахматова вспоминает свою жизнь после революции, бесконечные аресты и потери близких. Потом она читает стихи, в том числе открыто антисталинский реквием. Но рукописи, несмотря на просьбы гостя, не дают дарит, как и обещала свои книги, и проститься с новым другом, как окажется, на 19 лет. После встречи с Берлином дело Ахматовой получает категорию Ша – шпионаж. Со смертью Сталина личная холодная война Ахматовой с вождем не заканчивается. Льва Гумилева выпустят только в 1956 году. Боясь навредить сыну, она даже откажется от встречи с Исаей Берлином, к тому времени ставшим уже известным британским политологом и философом. Да, для нас это грязь на колошах, да, для нас это хруст на зубах, мы мельчим и не мелим и крошим тот ни в чем не замешанный прах. Мы ложимся в нее и становимся ею, от того и зовем, как свободно своею. Акматова came to Oxford in 1965 to receive an honorary degree, engineered by Berlin. Here she is in her room at Oxford's Randolph Hotel. Here she is after the degree ceremony on the arm of her companion, Anna Kaminskaya, granddaughter of her third husband. And here she is with Dmitry Obolensky, Berlin, and Kamenskaya in Oxford's Radcliffe Square. <laughs> this is the only photograph I know of Akhmatova and Berlin together. <laughs> Berlin's own account of his meetings with Akhmatova was first made public in 1976 in Amanda Haidt's biography of the poet which Berlin called the most dependable and deeply sincere work on Akhmatova's life that has yet been written. Haidt's brief account was largely based on what Berlin told her, as can be seen from his own long essay on the meetings, published in 1980 in his book, Personal Impressions. Eight years later, Berlin reached his 80th birthday, and the poet John Stallworthy of this college presented him with a long poem inspired by Berlin's account, which became the title poem in Stallworthy's next collection six years later. At about the same time as Stallworthy was writing his poem, Berlin repeated his story to his biographer, Michael Ignatieff, and it later formed the subject of one of Ignatieff's chapters. A book by the Hungarian author, Georgi Dalos, devoted to the meeting and its aftermath, appeared in German in 1996 and in English in 1998, the same year in which Ignatiev's biography was published. Berlin described Dalos's book as 
an inflated and totally superfluous piece of writing with various groundless hypotheses which add nothing to the sum of known facts. <laughs> To Eliana Chukoskaya, he wrote, the book makes too much of everything, squeezes every orange to its last drop of juice. Too much theorizing, too much psychological speculation, too much interpretation of this or that line of poetry. I wish people did not try to make elaborate constructions out of something which, being private, they cannot know the truth of. In 2000, a radio play by Jean Binney, Night Visit, was broadcast by the BBC. In this play, and in all non-documentary dramatizations of the story, it is stated, or implied, that Akhmatova and Berlin became lovers, even though Berlin always categorically denied that they even touched one another. <laughs> in a moment, you will hear a few short clips from this play, this radio play, while I show you some images from another one, which is a stage play by the Hawaiian author Nancy Moss. Yes. Nancy Moss's play was first produced in Honolulu in 2002 and revived in New York in 2011. Here is a trailer for the New York production. In World War II Leningrad, they fell in love. The glamorous Russian poet Anna Akhmatova age 55, and the Oxford Don, Isaiah Berlin, age 36. As if on the rim of a cloud, I remember your words. And because of my words to you, night became brighter than day. Presenting Anna, Love in the Cold War. At its 2011 New York showcase, the Smart Ticks critic called Anna a brilliant and proud woman who refuses to be broken. The New York Cool reviewer said, in Stalin's Russia, consider that every move you make and everything you say are under unrelenting surveillance. The play reveals the life of a whole nation when neighbors spied on each other and the government always knew what everyone did, spoke, and even thought about. There was neither despair nor shame. Not now, not afterward, not at the time. But in real life, right now, you hear how I am calling you, and that door that you have opened, I don't have the strength to slam. He returned to freedom, a voice for the Russian people, unbroken by Stalin, she stayed. This two-character play uses a unit set, Anna's simply furnished apartment. The photos that I'm about to show you now are still photographs, which are accompanied by audio clips from the radio play on the BBC, are from the same production whose trailer you've just witnessed. Nobody ever counts on you to know who said what, precisely where. My memory is often now quite hopelessly unreliable. But I remember impressions. And sometimes impressions are stronger than cold facts. Sometimes it only takes a moment. And there you go, you fall for someone. I just looked at your huge dark eyes. We'll say you sat over there and I sat over here and we never even touched and we talked of nothing but poetry. Here. Isn't this better than philosophy? Yes. And this? Yes. Yes. No. No, no, no. Let me. I, dear God, known for my intellectual honesty, said I'd never slept with you, not because we'd playfully agreed to say that, but because of my embarrassment that I'd made love to a woman so old, so very many years older. In the end, I lied to myself, and I'd come to believe it was true. None. Whore. 
2001, the poet Anatoly Naiman, Akhmatova's friend and companion, published his novelistic account of the relationship called Sir. Part of this has been translated into English in a collection of essays on Berlin the Man, published in 2009. In 2004, an opera composed by Mel Marvin with a libretto by Jonathan Levi, Guest from the Future, was staged at Bard College in Albany, New York. Here is an extract in which Akhmatova sings one of her famous poems about Berlin. <laughs> In 2009, three authors from the Anna Akhmatova Museum in Fontanidom, uh, Fountain House, published a book in which they argue that Berlin and Akhmatova met on three further occasions not mentioned by Berlin. They also dispute other parts of Berlin's account, in particular the interruption by Randolph Churchill reported by Berlin. Then in 2012 in New York, with a repeat in 2016, the Brooklyn Academy of Music staged Anna Akhmatova, The Heart is Not Made of Stone, a multimedia event with a dramatization of Berlin's visit at its heart, and music by Rachmaninoff, Prokofiev, and Shostakovich. <laughs> this too portrayed sexual contact between the protagonists. In the words of one member of the audience, I was horrified by a scene in which Berlin and Akhmatova lie kissing on the sofa like teenagers. <laughs> Before I show my final film clip, let me abandon my deliberately detached stance for a moment and suggest that the episode already has quite enough dramatic power, including no doubt a sexual charge, without debasing its dignity with gratuitous overt sexualization. I'm going to finish with an excerpt from a wonderful new document, documentary film about Berlin that will be premiered here in Wolfson on 14th of November at 5.15pm, a date for your diaries. The film has been made by the experienced and distinguished filmmaker Judith Wechsler, who has kindly given me permission to give you this sneak preview of the part about Akhmatova in Berlin. I hope that it will usefully tie together some of the things I've touched on all too briefly. We climbed up one of the steep, dark staircases to an upper floor, where admitted to Akhmatova's room. It was very barely furnished. Virtually everything in it had, I gathered, been looted or sold during the siege. There was a small table, three or four chairs, wooden chest, a sofa, and above the unlit stove, a drawing by Modigliani. A stately gray-haired lady in a white shawl draped about her shoulders slowly rose to greet us. Anna Andreevna Akhmatova was immensely dignified, with unhurried gestures, a noble head, beautiful, somewhat severe features, and an expression of immense sadness. I bowed. It seemed appropriate. For she looked and moved like a tragic queen. 
I was the first foreigner to whom she met since 1917. I sat in one corner of the room, she sat in the other corner, and I stayed till 11 in the morning. It was a kind of meeting of two people who began talking about each other and about themselves. It was a very intense, in a way rather intimate, conversation. She described her childhood on the shores of the Black Sea. She spoke of her visits to Paris before the First World War. Of her friendship with Amedeo Modigliani. She spoke of her first husband, the celebrated poet Gumilov, and spoke of the years 1937-38, when both her husband and her son had been arrested and sent to prison camps. This, of course, was to happen again. Her eyes had tears in them when she described the harrowing circumstances of his death. We talked about everything in the world. She then read her verse to me. Requiem, Mr. Previslovia, Strashny, Gody, Jovshny, Я провела 17 месяцев в тюремных очередях в Ленинграде. Как-то раз кто-то опознал меня. Тогда стоящая за мной женщина с голубыми губами, которая, конечно, никогда не слыхала моего имени, очнулась от свойственного нам всем оцепенения, Просила меня на ухо. Там все говорили шепотом. А это вы можете описать? И я сказала, могу. Она что-то вроде улыбки скользнула потому, что некогда было ее лицом. Хотелось бы всех поименно назвать, да отняли список и негде узнать. Для них соткалая широкий покров Из бедных у них же подслушанных слов. О них вспоминаю всегда и везде, О них не забуду и в новой беде. И если зажмут мой измученный рот, Которым кричит стомиллионный народ, Пусть так же они вспоминают меня. She um, refused to bow the knee in any way. She was there, and she knew what she wanted. And she told me I will never emigrate. I will die with my country. There are things out of this world. It's like something in a play or a dream. Strong dream quality. Everything and nothing else. Always through. For days. It is the most transforming event of my life. Because I'm suddenly in the presence of a poet of genius who revealed feelings, thoughts, forms of life which I'd never would have understood if they hadn't been. One's imagination was enormously widened by the mere fact that this person existed and was obviously became attached to me. It was obvious that I became infatuated with her in a sense. I thought she was wonderful. We got on beautifully, too well. Сливаю звуки в эфире, и заря притворилась тьмой, В навсегда немевшем мире два лишь голоса твой и мой, И под ветер с незримых ладок, Сквозь почти колокольный звон, Легкий блеск перекрестных раду, Разговор ночной превращен. They talked about everything. They talked about literature, about philosophy, about their personal lives. They had an automatic click straight away and an intense conversation that lasted so long without any pauses. She has spent 
25 years in almost total isolation from the rest of the world. So the fact that a Russian-speaking person comes to see her and, rem and knows about his, her poetry, she feels literally she's being exhumed from the dead. This is a young British embassy official who is a well-known Oxford philosopher, but he has no global reputation. So her validation of him is enormously important emotionally. You know, this is the greatest poet in, in the Russian language saying, you're important to me. So both receive decisive psychological validation at this critical moment in their, in their lives. Она, понимаете, назвала меня гостем из будущего, поэм без героев. And if I made the faintest political remark, she would point to the ceiling and say, Obrikaitam, she would say, the authorities. She truly believed that the Cold War was started by their meeting. What happened was that Stalin, when he heard of their meeting, had said, Our nun receives foreign agents now. That's what it's come to. And she became convinced from that moment onwards that she and I started the Cold War. Berlin always said, important as we were, we weren't quite that important. But I'm sure it was one of the things that fed into the sense of paranoia that led to the Cold War. She's put back in the deep freeze. She suffers, continues to suffer for another 10 years. She pays the most horrendous price. He pays no price. I think it accelerates his recommitment to Russian language, and literature, and tradition. You know, the, the wonderful study of Tolstoy comes after this in the early 50s, um, The Hedgehog and the Fox, the great study of Tolstoy's tragic uh, vision of history. I think all of that is one of the, one of the detonations. There are many detonations of, of that uh, meeting. He then manages, at the end of her life, to secure her honor degree at Oxford. I think he plays a very honorable role in having her recognized and validated as one of the greatest voices in Russian poetry.